let me uh, so uh, as we found in the previous webinars by Donna and Bonnie, uh, the key to changing health behaviors is to understand them in context. Uh, unhealthy behaviors, be them uh, excessive eating, lack of physical activity, tobacco, alcohol use, they do account for a substantial proportion of global morbidity and mortality. So. Uh, people have said, uh, be it medical or psychiatric illnesses, that initiating and maintaining behavior change and promoting self-care will be the wonder drugs of the 21st century. But to understand and intervene, we also need a accurate representations of these uh, health behaviors in the lived environment. <clears throat> now, the uh, advances in uh, wearable sensor technology uh, provide us many opportunities now to monitor health behavior in the wild and then use it as a basis for timely personalized health interventions. Billy uh, will be talking about these adaptive interventions in the coming weeks. <clears throat> Our two-part webinar today is directed towards helping you become uh, sophisticated consumers of measurement technologies for, the, for your own research studies. So in the first part, I will provide you with a framework of high-level requirements for selecting and deploying these measurement technologies. My focus of my talk is on the end user of these technologies, but I also hope that there are elements useful to the engineers and the data scientists amongst you. In the second part, Deepak will do a deep dive into some of the essential uh, technical uh, aspects of sensors. So let us start with a clinical state like depression and explore ways in which sensors can be used. Uh, this uh, paper actually from uh, Moore's group at Northwestern very nicely summarizes how raw data from sensors from sensors can be combined into high level uh, behavioral markers that can be used to infer clinical states like depression. Let's take, for example, sleep depression uh, or sleep disruption, which is a core symptom of depression. Uh, these markers of uh, sleep quality can be constructed from phone usage, bedtime, wake times, and then, uh, and then used to construct high level behavioral uh, markers. <clears throat> now, before we do a deep dive into sensors, let's first visit the construction of these sensors. Uh, in general, our sensors have three essential elements. A sensing uh, layer that uh, senses a change in the environment, a transducer that converts this sensed uh, information into a measurable signal, and finally an electronic system that processes the signal using complex uh, electronic circuitry. These process signals are then quantified by the display unit of the biosensor. So in the case of a point of care biosensor, uh, when say the analyte of interest is say glucose, when glucose binds to the sensing element, the energy of the biorecognition event is then transduced into a measurable signal, which is then fed into the electronic signal that processes the signal and then displays it in a user-friendly manner. In the case of activity sensors uh, used to sense motion, the sensing element would be a inertial measurement uh, unit or a IMU such as a accelerometer. Uh, here, any changes in acceleration produce a electrical charge that is processed and then displayed as a numeric graphic or tabular manner, depending on the requirements of the end user. Now, because actigraphs are the most commonly used sensors in most health studies, I will use uh, IMUs to anchor my talk. <clears throat> Now, unlike self-reports that tend to be highly unreliable and subject to different kinds of recall biases, personal sensing does offer multiple opportunities to measure human behavior continuously, objectively, and with minimal effort from the user. However, 
the very large variety of sensors available also pose uh, very cha many challenges to the M health researcher. So due to the, a lack of standardization amongst these sensors, they can vary greatly in terms of tech specs like sampling rate, uh, range, resolution, or in terms of their placement, uh, be it in the, at the waist or the wrist or the thigh, or they may have different pre-processing of the signals, uh, or they provide different outputs based on the proprietary algorithms they deploy, or they may have different data collection windows, you know, 10 hours a day, over four days, 24 seven. So all in all, this makes choosing a sensor for a particular uh, study very confusing. So then the question is, how does one go about identifying a sensor and then optimizing the match between the sensor and the uh, research application? I find this organizing framework provided by the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative very useful in guiding sensor choice. And I'll use this as a lattice for expanding on each of these elements. So when you are contemplating a sensor for a study, always start with the end in mind. Do not fall in love with the technology and then adapt it, your study to it. Uh, we should never let the technology drive the study. First, define the health condition you want to tackle, and then only seek out the best technology that will help you solve or answer your question or solve the problem. <clears throat> Uh, be very deliberate in your choice of health aspect to be studied and how it is framed. You know, choose one, something that the patient really cares about, uh, would benefit from treatment, and where an improvement in assessment would be uh, valuable. Absent that patient consideration, you are not going to get buy-in. The scope of your assessment also should be defined by the context of interest. For example, you, you may want to determine the effectiveness of a new therapy in heart failure patients using a measure of their functional activities, let's say walking capacity as a proxy. So then your endpoints would, would derive from that context of interest. Now, a common gold standard is the six minute walk test. This uh, provides a summary measure of their cardiopulmonary and musculoskeletal systems. But the testing also requires subjects to travel to the clinic at regular intervals uh, to undergo that test. Now with wearable sensors, you can capture data at a much greater convenience to the subjects who wear these small devices in the comfort of their homes and maintain their daily routine. So your digital endpoints could be possible measures of walking capacity like uh, duration of walking per day or the number of subjects walk per day. Now, the large amounts of high dimensional data that you are collecting with these sensors also set the stage for mathematically derived uh, novel endpoints. <clears throat> Now, once you have defined the clinical problem and the context of use, the next step is to seek out the best technology to answer your question. Uh, in, in, in evaluating sensors, the technical performance should be a key consideration. So this is usually done first through a technical verification of the sensors uh, measurement performance. Now, what technical verification does, it ensures that the sensor meets all the engineering requirements of the use case and that the sensor will provide you a reliable and accurate data collection system. Typically these uh, technical verification activities include uh, features like accuracy, how close is the measurement of the sensor uh, to the true value or precision, which is how close these measurements of the same item are to each other. Uh, the resolution being the smallest amount of change that can be detected by the sensor. Things like uh, inter and intra device variability are also very important. Uh, each sensor has its own issue like noise and drift and uh, this needs to be accounted for. 
Now, typically, all these uh, features are done as part of the technical verification, and this is accomplished by the engineering team or the company that is providing you the sensors. Be very sure to ask for it before you deploy the sensors clinically. Uh, the other aspect of technical performance is the optimization for the context of use. And here you are actually validating uh, it in a small group of patients, uh, in both in controlled environments and possibly the real world. And technical, and this clinical validation is carried out by the uh, end user. <clears throat> uh, next, you begin to think about the persons who will be using the devices. Uh, you uh, need to uh, engage uh, patients and site personnel very early on in the planning of clinical trials that use uh, mobile technologies. Remember, people ignore design that ignores people. Uh, keep that in mind. The questions you should be asking include, uh, who's the target subject I'm considering for this trial? Uh, does she or he really care about the health aspect that I'm interested in? And uh, uh, things like, what is the subject burden? This is very important. Is it something that is comfortable? Is it stylish? Is it something that they will wear on a daily basis for extended periods of time? If it is not usable, the sensor quickly becomes nothing more than a shiny toy. The user quickly uses uh, loses interest. <clears throat> A fundamental question you should ask, will the device integrate seamlessly into their daily life? Uh, Mark Weiser, who's the father of ubiquitous uh, computing had uh, said, uh, the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. I, I find a lot of value in this statement. In my own studies, I leverage uh, sensors embedded within everyday consumer items. This way, I'm gaining from established health behaviors and do not force patients to adopt new ones. Data management is another critical aspect you should be thinking about. Uh, for example, a uh, common actigraph will embed uh, things like uh, an accelerometer, a gyroscope, a magnetometer, and a temperature sensor. <clears throat> Engineers usually use a combination of firmware and hardware and, and software to do the data management. Now, uh, firmware usually controls basic device functions, such as the configuration of data, logic programming, communications between and within hardware components using machine learning commands. So in a sensing module like this, you can quickly see uh, you have, it will have a sense uh, electronics module to sense the motion captured by the three axis uh, accelerometer. And then it amplifies the signal and conditions it. Uh, it will have a analog to digital uh, converter, uh, a digital filter that filters out noise or interference. Uh, you'll have a fee for a first in first start buffer for storing data and also working with the power management system to put the processor in a low power mode until it responds to the, uh, needs to respond to the uh, accelerometer and the motion. And also there is a Bluetooth uh, uh, controller so that the data can be uploaded to the uh, acquisition device like the software and sent to the cloud. So all in all, even these tiny sensors are quite complex. The software part of it, is, it's usually the one that handles operations that uh, interface with the user. This would be probably the app that, uh, uh, that uh, you give feedback to the patients. And, and this often manages, the software manages the data transfer, both the uploads as well as the downloads. <clears throat> sampling rates. You should be aware of the sampling rates of the sensor. Uh, Deepak's talk to follow will cover sampling rates and uh, filters in greater details. Now, typically a common use uh, unit of sampling rates is Hertz, which essentially stands for samples per minute. Now, 
Sampling rates from sensor uh, can range from one to 100 hertz. Uh, a 30 hertz sampling rate would generally be sufficient for looking at general movements in the trunk, but that may not be suitable for specific applications like detecting gait patterns or peak accelerations during running. And less than uh, optimal sampling can impact the inference of these activities. Uh, let's see how sampling rates can affect uh, inference. Here we have data streams from a accelerometer for the same activity sampled at both 50 hertz and 5 hertz. And uh, if you look at the lower sampling rates, you can from we can see that the lower sampling rates tend to lose the high frequency aspects of the accelerometer. If you uh, there's almost total lock, uh, loss of peaks between the six and eight second period with the five hertz sampling frequency on the uh, X channel. So you can get very inconsistent data representations at different uh, sampling rates. Now, if you're planning to deploy a commercial sensor, one important question to ask the vendor is, can we get to the raw data or, uh, or will you be given data that has been heavily processed? If you can get to the raw data, you can actually end up creating more meaningfully, uh, clinically meaningful endpoints. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, your deficiencies in filter selection can lead to uh, a loss in signal selection. You know, you can have a loss of uh, sensitivity in low intensity movements or a plateau in high intensity movements. Think about data transfer. What about the data transfer? How do we get the data off the device? Will it use something like the Bluetooth uh, low energy protocols, BLE protocols? If yes, then what is its uh, impact on the battery life? Uh, one issue that arises with variable sensors is that the wireless transmissions from the sensor can pose a security risk for interception and insertion of rogue data uh, if it is not encrypted or protected by other security methods. Uh, be also clear about where the data will be stored. Will it be stored on the cloud on a uh, AWS instance? Will that server be HIPAA compliant? Uh, you also need to understand who is going to be responsible for the data and its integrity. Will it be the technical team? Will it be the data management team? and who will have access to it? How secure is it? Uh, you need to have a very good understanding of the end-to-end -end risk posed by your study. The study and data management flow should be mapped before the study starts. In fact, in the US, the NIH and NSF require you to provide a data management plan for your sensor-based studies. <clears throat> uh, Major concern with variables uh, is what we call functional uncertainty. This emerges when uh, users are unable to understand how, why, or by whom their data is being used. Uh, concerns about these privacy and security are usually uh, manifestations of this uncertainty. So your informed consent should be uh, very simple and understandable. Uh, Camille Nebecker and uh, Tilda Circle will be doing a deep dive into this aspect uh, later on. Uh, one of the challenges that you will face is that many IRBs will have difficulty differentiating between low risk and wellness devices versus medical devices. Uh, you, you need to have a good strategy for informed consent. I personally use a combination of a e-recruitment website uh, with explainer videos and a stepped e-consent part of REDCap to ensure uh, patient understanding of the study. Very important that you identify ways to return value to participa participants throughout your trial. Uh, this may be the return of outcomes based uh, outcomes data collected by your mobile technologies. It could be things like steps per day and how often they have met. When 
patients don't understand the represented data, they're less motivated to use the variable consistently. Let's talk a little about the regulatory aspects of your study. When you plan to you know, deploy commercial grade devices, make sure you are aware of the 510K status for the device. Uh, 510K is basically a, a pre-market uh, submission made to the FDA. It's not necessarily a requirement for selecting a device, but you should be aware of this when you uh, negotiate with vendors or companies who will provide you their sensors. Let's switch now to the operational aspects of these biosensors. Always cite your, uh, uh, you know, your uh, uh, sense of performance within the context of use. So a risk sensor on a quantified self type of participant is a very different use case than attaching it uh, to patients in the ICU or using it for early post discharge monitoring. So uh, also make sure that uh, when you're working with a commercial manufacturer, you know, talk about the firmware and the software. Ask them if you can lock down the firmware for the duration of the study. If the firmware changes, it can impact the way data is being collected. Uh, this also applied it, applies to the automated upgrades to the operating systems of phones. Uh, when participants upgrade their phones or the phone OS uh, system upgrades automatically, it can stop data collection. I have been and other uh, uh, of my colleagues have been tripped up by these uh, frequent updates that Androids and uh, Apple sends out and it, it completely messes up or stops the data collection. So be, be aware of that. Uh, beyond the participants, be also very sensitive to the burden imposed on care teams. Uh, in the post-COVID uh, uh, era, people are stressed out. They don't have bandwidth. You're going to add one more thing. So be very sensitive to that as you plot out your studies. Uh, also think about optimizing sensor. In, in terms of location, uh, for be aware that these positioning of sensors is largely will be largely driven by user acceptance rather than what would be the best location for activity recognition. So think very uh, closely about what you're trying to measure. Is it tors torso movements or uh, heel strikes? Uh, for example, for daily physical activity associated movements, a sensor that is applied to the waist or, uh, or, or a hip uh, would suffice. However, if your clinical question is about jogging or how heel strike accelerations uh, affect bone turnover, you will need to identify a feasible location like a ankle or knee. Now, the sensors you choose could be either three axis, uh, like a simple accelerometer, or it could be six axis where it involves a gyroscope. Uh, the, the accelerometer provides information about accelerations in the X, Y, and Z axis, uh, while the uh, gyroscope augments it by providing information of rotations around the X, Y, and Z axis. However, the six axis uh, sensor may not be enough for monitoring over adequate period, extended periods of time because you know, small errors build up into each axis and over time these errors can add up to a drift in the absolute uh, direction. Uh, these are some uh, data collection over three seconds from accelerometer and a uh, gyroscope. To to handle uh, drift, uh, what engineers do is they add this, uh, add a directional sensor like a three axis magnetometer. So the extra magnetic field information here allows the sensing algorithms to compensate for uh, small drifts 
or much larger, uh, longer periods of time. So we can track the absolute position, changes in position and orientation much more accurately. So understand the subtle differences between three axis, six axis, or nine axis uh, I, IMUs. Uh, we talked about sampling rates. Sampling rates also will, the, the ones you choose will depend upon the activities you like being you like to classify. For example, if you're trying to do uh, very small motions like uh, tremors of the fingers, you may want a you may require a high sampling frequency, uh, while a lower frequency would suffice for coarser movements like swimming. The majority of uh, daily physical activity movements are in the one to five hertz uh, range. So a sampling of 10 hertz would be adequate adequate for a sensor that's applied to the chest. However, like we said, if uh, your interest is on jogging and heel strike accelerations and bone turnover, your sampling rates will need to be higher. Uh, we know that foot acceleration can reach up to 60 hertz due to the heel strike of walking and running, so your sampling range should change uh, accordingly. Now, also keep in mind that in data, when it is collected in a natural environment with high sampling rates, can lead to rapid depletion of battery. What this will mean is uh, if your battery doesn't last uh, for the whole day, you will have loss of uh, blocks of data, raw data. And that data is very essential for the activity classifier. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a inherent uh, uh, drift to sensors. So this is something also you should be aware of and, and work with your engineering team to see how they can be compensated for. <clears throat> now, technology failure is inevitable. You know, technology is not magic and you should anticipate and prepare for it. Uh, the best thing that you can do is to embrace and engage an engineering collaborator in your studies to help you tackle and appreciate the technical issues. Uh, you need to have processes to detect technology malfunction in place. Quality management of data collected from, uh, from sensors is very important. So think about having automated data deficiency indicators or a dashboard in place to monitor the quality of data collected by mobile technologies. I employ dashboards on, uh, on a uh, freeware called Grafana. It allows me to see uh, battery depletion and if people are using the device or if they're having technical mal uh, malfunctions of the device. Uh, also be ready to uh, plan for replacing malfunctioning devices. If a mobile technology stops working, uh, it's not performed as desired or it's not meeting a target expectation uh, due to defects, uh, a replacement needs to be sent out as soon as possible to minimize the impact of technology failure on the study. So always have a inventory of extra uh, um, devices that can be sh uh, shipped directly to study patients. And so. So make sure that uh, when you're choosing devices, they are not very expensive, but uh, so affordability uh, and low cost should be a consideration. At the same time, also remember to provide participants with easy access to uh, technical support. If they are struggling with uh, technical issues, they can press a button on their app and that alerts the technical team that they are, someone is dealing with uh, technical problems. Be aware of the time study of your uh, time horizon for your study. Uh, this is very important because uh, technology changes very rapidly. And so uh, some of the technology can become obsolete. More importantly, the technology you're using can be discontinued as we saw that with the Microsoft wa uh, watch or the job one. Keep in mind that many of these startup companies have less than a five year life cycle, they go bust or they are acquired and the company that acquires them may disestablish the sensor you're using with. You don't want that to happen in the middle of your study. Also think about scalability. 
Uh, is your need 50 sensors or 50,000 sensors? If you are dealing or you're depending on in-house sensors made by your engineering collaborators, remember that there will be a finite supply for, of these sensors. So be very aware of that. If you're going with a commercial uh, sensor, then you may have access to a lot more uh, of these sensors. The most important thing that you can do is to conduct a pilot study or a run-in study to kind of determine if the device you're contemplating is fit for purpose. The great thing about this feasibility study is it, it brings everybody on the same page and, you helps, uh, and it helps identify any potential snags, things like bandwidth, usability, and things like that. Do not underestimate technology setup and cost. I and other sophisticated users have been blindsided by it. Uh, does the site, the clinical site where you'll conduct your study have access to IT service providers to enable a more efficient uh, uh, issue escalation and resolution? Be prepared for the additional time and costs required to incorporate these technology into clinical trials. Do have plans for technology loss or malfunction and make sure that these plans are capable of being put in place at short notice. Uh, we, we talked about power consumptions. Uh, and uh, so the charging and syncing of your devices should be uh, also thought about. You know, small things like these can very quickly uh, gum up your study. So factor in again, the support system for these uh, small uh, mundane uh, elements. Onboarding is very, important. Do not assume digital literacy, uh, not only for subjects, but also on care providers. Make sure that you are developing effective training modules for site staff around these uh, technologies. It's very important that the site staff uh, who will be interacting with patients are very conversant with the technologies that the, your study participants will be using. Uh, I find training videos like uh, very useful to offer uh, hands-on practice with these technologies and also allow them to establish familiarity. Uh, I cannot emphasize more the issue of burden on care teams. Keep in mind, especially in the COVID and post-COVID era, you will be dealing with overwhelmed and stressed out care teams. Your study will only add one more thing on their plate. They will not share your passion or interest in the clinical problem you are attend, attempting to tackle. Uh, patient compliance, uh, it, it contributes a lot to the data you hope to cover. So uh, in, you make sure you have dashboards uh, to monitor whether people are using your devices and think about interventions such as reminders to the subjects, you know, which uh, to improve compliance if it falls below a certain threshold. And this leads, of course, to data yield. Uh, what is the data yield of your sensor? Is it good enough for the power of the study? So the data yield can drop dramatically if patients stop using uh, your study or push, it, push your device into a drawer. And your, your sample size needs to also uh, acknowledge that uh, eventuality upfront. Now, data interoperability is, can be a huge problem when you're dealing with uh, devices with proprietary systems, which are by necessary closed system. Uh, also, when uh, the current infrastructure in healthcare settings does not allow integration of sensor data with EMRs. Uh, those of you who interact with EPIC uh, will know what I'm talking about. Your sensor data will not flow into EMR systems, so there is no opportunity for data storage and linking with clinical data or for further analysis during a patient care journey. So think about this upfront. Uh, there will be measurement errors that can uh, happen uh, due to a variety of uh, bodily mo mo motions, environmental noise, sensor disconnections, uh, improper sensor application, sensor failure, 
to the extent you can with your engineering colleagues uh, utilize AI approaches that helps you identify that and reduce the variability in the data uh, and ensure accurate and repeatable measures. Finally, factor in the failure rates. Uh, there will be anything from 5% to 20% failure rate. So uh, factor that into your power and study design and also anticipate the impact of these very frequent uh, firmware and software upgrades because your it will mess up your data uh, collection for a, a certain period of time. So in summary, uh, sensors do provide tremendous opportunities to measure health indicators in the wild. Know what you want to measure before selecting the technology. Uh, sensor collection should be very specification driven and collaborative. Make sure you have a, it's a multidisciplinary effort and your fit for purpose should be justified upfront through uh, verification and validation. And most importantly, I cannot emphasize this enough, make sure you have run-in studies to identify pain points and minimize the risk of uh, failure. Wonderful. I will 